Hey, welcome to Brown Bag History for March 15th, 2023. Hard to believe we're in the middle of March already. And as we begin, we acknowledge that the land around Revelstoke and on the Columbia River and its tributaries is the Sinaiq's homeland and traditional territory. We acknowledge the ties of the Sequipmec, the Okanagan Nation Alliance and the Tanaha to this land. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations and respectfully honor their traditions and culture. So today we're talking about um, women in the mountains. And uh, again, that's one of these huge topics that I'm gonna try to condense into you know, 45 minutes or so. Uh, but it's, I'm focusing on a, on a few stories. Uh, of course, the Vox family was really um, famous for their uh, work in the Il Silhouette uh, Glacier and the recording of, of uh, of the uh, recession of the glacier. Um, Mary Vox um, was uh, born in, um, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania. And um, a lot of these women who are coming out, they were, they were Quaker. And uh, Quaker women were, uh, Quakers believed in education of women, more so than a lot of other groups at the time. So a lot of these um, Quaker women were well-educated. And um, Mary Vox started coming out here with her brothers, William and George. Uh, they first visited Glacier House in 1887 and photographed the Yellow Silhouette Glacier. They returned in 1894 and were startled by the recession of the glacier in that uh, short period of time. So they began formal studies and scientific reports on the glacier's movements and Mary was included in that work. She didn't consider herself a skilled climber but she climbed in the process of her scientific recordings. Um, she was the first woman to reach the summit of Mount Stephen. And as you can see, she is climbing in the skirt. Um, some women did later use um, breeches, but a lot of them did climb in skirts. Um, she was also a skilled photographer, painter, and botanist. Um, a lot of the, the um, the, the colleges where the women were educated back east, there was Bryn Mawr College. They really, they had a focus on botany and natural studies. So um, she was a, a botanist. Uh, she published the book, uh, North American Wildflowers in 1925. Uh, the um, local filmmaker, Agat Bernard, who did our film, Washed Away, uh, did a, a, a short film about Mary Vox a few years ago, it's called called Carving Landscapes. I believe you can find it online. It's just a lovely little uh, portrait of Mary Vox. And uh, she uh, had a costume made and an actor to recreate uh, Mary Vox climbing. Uh, so it's a quite a lovely little portrait of, of uh, this remarkable woman. Another uh, really remarkable woman, and she deserves a whole talk on herself, but I'm just going to briefly talk about her today is Mary Schaefer Warren. And uh, there, there's one book on her uh, called uh, No Ordinary Woman, story of Mary Schaefer Warren. And um, she was born in Philadelphia into a Quaker family in 1861. She made her first trip to the Canadian Rockies in 1899 and uh, also came into the Selkirk. She was at Banff, Lake Louise and at uh, Glacier House. Um, I'm assuming that most people here are aware that there was a big hotel at uh, Glacier House. There's actually a photograph of it on the wall there. It was maintained by the Canadian Pacific Railway Company. And it really was sort of the, the seat of uh, the base for mountaineering in the Selkirks. That's where uh, people would come and, and establish sort of their, their home base and then climb from there. And at that time, the base of the Yellow Glacier it was only about a 20 minute walk from the from the hotel. Uh, so it, it was actually an easy uh, hike or uh, walk for most people. Uh, but Mary Vox um, met um, uh, Dr. Charles Schaefer, who was a medical doctor and a member of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, and they were married. Um, he was about 25 years older than she was. In 1891, they uh, were in Canada for botanical studies. And uh, Mary learned to draw the specimens in scientific detail. Um, I think I've got an error in the, her first trip to this area was 1889, not 99. Um, 
she had dried and, and uh, pressed uh, specimens and reproduced them in detailed watercolors and developed a technique for photographing them to complete the scientific record. She was elected a member of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia in 1896 and was a member of the Geographical Society of, of America. Um, her husband died in 1902 and uh, she returned to the Rockies and Selkirks to finish her husband's work and spent most of the rest of her life in Canada. In 1911, she published a book called Old Indian Trails of the Canadian Rockies and uh, climbed in the course of her work, but she said she was not a not a, a comfortable climber. She said she was scared stiff of, at rocks and precipices, but she was up there just the same. Uh, she felt that mountain climbing for the sake of saying that she was the first person on a certain peak had not charms for her. Um, a lot of uh, people, um, uh, a lot of the women were uh, had female companions with them so that they weren't traveling alone with uh, with male guides. Um, in 1911, she was asked to survey um, Maline Lake for the Geographical Society, Geological S Survey of Canada. Um, one of her her uh, favorite guides was a man named Billy Warren. And they were married in 1915. And uh, after that time, she lived in Banff. Um, in uh, 1903, the explorer, James Hector, um, he, he was, was a member of the Palliser expedition and explored the, um, the he's the one that like the kicking horse um, pass. Uh, he is the one that got kicked by the horse. Uh, so he was doing exploration work in the Rockies in, uh, the 1870s, you know, quite early work in that area. He was both the, uh, uh, a doctor and a geologist, um, but um, he, so he survived the, you know, being kicked by the horse, that's another whole story. Um, ended up in New Zealand where he was doing, uh, did a lot of survey work in New Zealand and became chancellor of the university in uh, Wellington, New Zealand. In 1903, he was asked to come back to uh, Canada to uh, talk about his experiences in during that early exploration of the Palliser expedition. So he, he and his son Douglas uh, came across to Vancouver and then by train to Glacier House. And um, Mary Schaefer recalls that uh, she was in Glacier House and um, she heard this man saying, I'm, uh, I've come back to find my grave because after he got kicked by the horse, the, the rest of his party thought he was dead and was actually started digging his grave. So um, she, her ears perked up, at, perked up at this and she went and introduced herself and he was there giving a talk that evening. Um, but her, his son, who was 26 years old, developed uh, appendicitis and they brought him to uh, Revelstoke by train and got him into the hospital, but his appendix burst and he died. And he's buried in Revelstoke. And Mary Schaefer was there with with uh, Sir James Hector when he buried his son. She was one of a few people that was there. So um, you know, some amazing stories there. And as I say, I could spend the whole talk on her, um, but uh, we'll move on to some other stories here. Um, the, um, we have a, a the, uh, Selkirk Range by, uh, A.O. Wheeler actually has a, uh, section in there called Women, Women Climbers, and, um, he talks about the first attempt on Sir Donald by a lady made by Mrs. Florence Goff, registering from Ottawa, Ontario. The guides were Edward Foytes and Charles Clark. They left Glacier House at 3 a.m. on June 7th in 1901, uh, but it began snowing before they reached the moraine of the small glacier on the face of uh, Sir Donald. By one o'clock, the overhanging rock at the head of the cool couloirs, where danger from falling rock is incurred on the present line of ascent, was reached. Was reached. Um, this is actually quoting from Wheeler. said, here it was seen that further progress was out of the question if it was uh, not desired to spend a night on the mountain. So it was decided to return, and after some difficulty, Glacier House was reached at 7.45 p.m. 
Uh, but a couple of months after that, on August 3rd, 1901, uh, the first ascent uh, was reached by uh, uh, Mrs. Um, Behrens of Kent, England. And um, they left, uh, she was, her husband was with her as well. And they left Glacier at 3.15 a.m., accompanied by the guide, guides Carl Schlinniger and Charles Clark. Mrs. Behrens rode a pony to the end of the trail where the steep ascent begins. The summit, they gained the summit at 11.30 a.m. and flashlight signals exchange, exchanged with the tower at the hotel. Uh, they took a few photographs and erected a small cross of stones on the summit. Um, the minute book at Glacier was kind of the record of a lot of uh, uh, these uh, the, the climbers. That's where they were recording a lot of their observations and their notes of the climbs. And Mrs. Behrens wrote, when we first got on the rocks, I asked the guides how long it would take us to reach the top. Their reply was, oh, four or five hours. I thought to myself, what nonsense. I'm sure we can easily get there in an hour or so. <laughs> Alas, my conceit was very quickly taken out of me as I found that it was not such an easy climb as it looked. Be wise friends and never despise a mountain. It always gets the best of you in the end. I looked down once and after that carefully avoided it as the valley of snow and ice below looked as far as we were concerned, as far away as Piccadilly or Chestnut Street. And to look up seemed almost as bad. In climbing, always look for the next foothold and nothing more as if you look down, it is apt to frighten you. And if you look up, you get discouraged. And this photograph was taken by uh, Mary Schaefer. And you can see she's, uh, uh, just she looks she looks so cute there. She just has these cute little breeches and a jaunty little cap and uh, a white blouse and a little bow tie. Uh, very jaunty looking. Um, it was noted that the uh, first ascent of uh, Peak by a lady of Eagle Peak by a lady was in September eighteenth, nineteen o one. This is also from A.O. Wheeler. Um, Together with the guide Edward Foytes, I had the, this is a, a Henry, Henrietta Altuzo of uh, Warlingham, England, who recorded this. Together with the guide Edward Foytes Sr., I had the pleasure of ascending Mount Eagle on Wednesday, September 18th. We started at seven o'clock, went up the trail, through a little brush and up by the arete. We arrived on the summit at five minutes to 12. We made the return journey in four hours by the valley between Eagle and Green Mountains, a somewhat fatiguing way, since at this time of the year, there is not much snow, but long stretches of rock and stone. The views from Eagle are most magnificent and I counted 102 glaciers. This was the first ascent made this season and it was the first time any woman had gone up. Uh, what difficulties there were, were reduced to a minimum by the skill and care of the excellent guide. Um, Henrietta had uh, climbed in the Alps in 1896 and uh, came to Canada in 1898 uh, to visit her brother, who was working as a mining engineer at Nelson. And they stayed at Banff and Glacier House and Henrietta fell in love with the mountains. And um, so in uh, that return trip in 1901, that's when she made the ascent recorded there. Um, she came back in, uh, to Canada in 1904 and did several climbs in the Rockies and Selkirks including a climb of Mount Sir Donald in nine and a half hours, which was close to a record at that time. Um, by the early 1900s, there was definitely increased interest in climbing by ladies. In um, the um, Alpine Club of Canada was formed in uh, 1906 uh, by A.O. Wheeler and Elizabeth Parker, who was not a climber herself, but um, uh, she was, um, a reviewer for the Manitoba Free Press, and she reviewed A.O. Wheeler's uh, Selkirk Range, which was actually written as a government report, but probably the most interesting government report you're ever likely to read. And um, she chastised him for suggestions that Canadians form a chapter of, a, of the, an American climbing club and said that Canada needed its own club, not a branch of another one. So uh, the two of them were, were responsible for for the formation of the Alpine Club of Canada. Uh, we have a full set of the journals from the first journal in 1907. 
up to the um, up to about 2015. We've got those in our library. If anybody ever wants to come in and, and read them, they're welcome to do that. They're a really great record of, of that early work. Uh, the first uh, uh, camp of the Alpine Club of Canada was at Yoho in 1906. And there were several women present there, including some from Revelstoke, amongst them Eva Hobbs, we'll be talking about in a few minutes. And uh, they're, they're kind of the, the test, uh, sort of the membership to, to be a full member, you had to do a climb of Mount Vice President and um, in uh, Yoho. So uh, there were several women who achieved that at that time. Um, Jean Parker, who is the daughter of Elizabeth Parker, um, has a piece in the 1909 Alpine Club of Canada Journal and um, it, on the second descent of Mount Tupper which uh, she did in uh, 1908. And uh, there's an article describing uh, the, the, whole, um, the, the whole climb. Um, the, the first ascent had just been two years previously in 1906 by a German climber. And um, so when they were preparing for their climb, um, she said, uh, frequent trips were made down the track to look at Mount Cheops the weatherman of the Selkirks. I was almost afraid to leave the hotel for fear of disturbing that most important factor, the weather. At, um, so at quarter past three on the on Saturday afternoon, they left for Hermit Hut where they were to spend the night before making the climb the next day. The hut was about 2,300 feet above Rogers Pass, built by the CPR for the convenience of climbers. She said, uh, nothing is too bad to say about that trail. It is very steep, very stony, and on this occasion, very wet and slippery and altogether stupid. I found it necessary to stop often, and my stalwart companion felt anxious, as he afterwards confessed, about my staying power for the real climb. They reached the hut at six o'clock. She said, at nine o'clock, our spirits were down to zero, for the rain came down in torrents. Uh, once the rain stopped, they settled down to sleep. She said, I had some difficulty in curling myself up to be free of the pools of water for our tin roofed hut leaked. There was more rain during the night and they were worried about ice and the rocks. They left the hut at 5 a.m. and reached the summit by 10 a.m. By 10 to, eight to, to seven that evening, they were back at Glacier House dressing for dinner. And uh, as I say, if you want to read the whole account, it's here in the journal. Um, there was in the same um, in the same volume, the 1909 uh, journal. There is an article um, called "Mountain Climbing for Women" uh, by Mary E. Crawford, and uh, she said that the first recorded climb by a woman was in 1809 when a woman named, named Maria Paradis was taken to the summit of Mount Mont Blanc in the Alps uh, by a, a climber named Jacques Balmat. And she did it for money, which she, which she admitted. Um, uh, but uh, the author of this article said, neither can she be said to have climbed the mountain as she was literally taken by Belmat and held up, hauled up like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> um, the, and uh, the um, Maria Paradis herself says, um, but thanks to the curiosity of the public, I have made a very nice profit out of it. And that was what I reckoned on. Um, so um, the, this author, uh, Mary Crawford, there's lots of Marys here. Uh, Mary Crawford said, um, there's no recreation, which in all aspects of surrounding and exercise will bring about a quicker rejuvenation of worn out nerves tired brains and flabby muscles than mountaineerian. Ennui has no place in the vocabulary of the woman who climbs. The words which wrote it are enthusiasm and exhilaration. And uh, the whole article is, is really encouraging women to get out and climb. So there's a, a, a couple of photographs accompanying the article. And these women are wearing skirts. So it was uh, some women still chose to wear to wear skirts when they were climbing. Um, Mary Jo Bakley is probably one of my favorite people. 
just uh, what I've been able to uncover about her. Really a remarkable woman. Um, she first came to, um, she was um, from New York, but she came to Revelstoke first in July of 1905 with a botanical party from the uh, Dr. Charles H. Shaw, who was a botanist at the Medical Chirurgical College of Philadelphia. And they came here to specifically to collect plant specimens. Um, they were, um, she was born in, origi originally born in Ohio in 1878, graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy in 1897, and received her master's degree in English and American history from Columbia University in 1909, so very educated woman. Um, so she, uh, when she came here in 1905, um, one of the varieties that she particularly found was a new variety of what was known as a spleenwort fern. Um, well on the 1905 trip, they made a 10 day trip into the Selkirks from the Big Bend and they walked into the, the Big Bend. Um, they also uh, spent time at Glacier House and Banff um, she made more than, than one trip out here. There was another trip in 1907 and uh, found an article from the New York Times published uh, September 25th, 1907. It was entitled, Four Women Climb Selkirk Mountains. And um, it said that, um, it, and it was about Charles Shaw's expedition to the Selkirks with uh, four women and five men, including himself. It, the, the article said, clad in corduroy skirts, they buckled their packs on their shoulders in the morning, and whether the paths led over mountains, where every step was made by cutting a foothold in the ice, or through the thick bushes, they were ever at the side of the men. They were lost for 13 days in a snowstorm on top of one of the mountains, only Mr. Peterson with them. There were no tents in the party then. The snow blinded their way. They had four days provisions. They slept in rock caverns and stretched their provisions over a week. Dr. Shaw is authority for the statement that when they faced starvation, not one of them became hysterical. After going hungry for a day, they discovered a cabin left near an abandoned mine. It was stored with provisions. Shaw said, you don't know what a woman can do until you give her a chance. None of these women was especially robust. I'll venture to say that any of the anemic looking stenographers and typewriters you'll find working in a small room on the 18th floor of an office building could do the same thing if she believed she could do it, do it at the start. Um, so uh, Mary uh, Job came back to the Selkirks in 1909 to join an expedition to the headwaters of Gold River. And uh, had another woman, Bess McCarthy was with her. They were part of the expedition of Professor Herschel C. Parker, who was the head of physics department at Columbia University, and Howard Palmer, a lawyer from Connecticut, who were heading the expedition for the Dominion Topographical Survey. Uh, Palmer produced the 1915 reconnaissance map of the Big Bend, which we have in our archives, and actually we have on display and for sale. Um, the, um, climbed uh, Mount Sir, Sir Sanford during that trip as well. Um, there's also an article from the September, New York Times, September 25th, uh, 1909, said Miss Mary Job, an instructor in history at the Normal College of the city, and in her student days, an athletic Bryn Mawr girl, was a member of the recent Canadian Topographical Survey Expedition, exploring in the big bend of the Columbia at Mount, at Mount Sanford, British Columbia, the highest of the Selkirks. The party traveled over uncharted rivers, cut through a primeval forest, and explored dangerous glacier-clad mountains, bringing back scientific data and a picture history of a region never before penetrated by white men. While admitting that the trip was strenuous, Miss Job says that it was altogether delightful and that she never felt overtaxed even after a 12 hours climb she said it is, it is not too difficult for any woman of courage used to outdoor sports and exercise. And she did a lot of other climbs in the Selkirks and near Mount Robson. And there's actually um, Mount Job um, near Mount Robson and in there's Mount Robson Provincial Park uh, named after her. 
1924, she married Carl Akeley, who was an explorer, scientist, uh, sculptor, and taxidermist. He was the African specialist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. That's the museum where they filmed uh, Night at the Museum, the original Night at the Museum movie. And uh, Carl Akeley was in charge of the African Hall in that museum. Um, he died on a, of a tropical disease in the Belgian Congo two years later, and Mary took over uh, his work as advisor in the development of the African Hall of the museum, which, which was later named the Akeley African Hall. She held that position until 1938. So I like to think that we've got a little bit of a connection with the Night at the Museum movies through, uh, through Mary Jo Bakley. In September of 1937, Mary Jo Bakley came back to this area and uh, she did a trip with the Earl and Estelle Dickey and Earl's sister Shella. And they uh, went up the uh, Big Bend Highway as far as Goldstream, camping overnight at Downey Creek. And uh, she was happy to see you know, uh, places that she'd been there uh, more than you know, 30 years ago when she would made the trip on foot. And uh, it said that uh, Mrs. Akeley, Miss Dickey, George Merkel and Earl Dickey uh, left for Donald where they traveled by auto to boat encampment, uh, Canoe River and other places on the east leg of the Big Bend Highway. And uh, Mary Job was talking about her 1905 trip uh, she said that uh, on one occasion, she walked from Revelstoke to the Groundhog Basin, where Dr. Shaw had his permanent scientific camp. And two years later, she again walked to the Standard Basin and the headwaters of Downey Creek. So pretty amazing, amazing woman. And this photograph was taken by Earl Dickey in uh, her uh, 1937 trip to the, to the Big Bend. Um, Eva Hobbs uh, was... Um, born, um, came to um, Donald with her family in uh, 1892. Donald then was a divisional point for the railway. And um, she um, went to uh, high school in uh, Newest Minster and had a teaching certificate at the age of 17. Uh, she went to a um, little tiny place called Whitewater, which was between Caslow and New Denver. and. Um, she said that there was a boy in the class who was the same age as her. Um, she said, uh, well, you see how big I am, which wasn't very big. And I had a big boy, 17. Well, he undertook to boss the teacher. The teacher undertook to boss the boy. That wasn't fun, and he quit. Um, she taught at Ella Silhouette uh, with 15 pupils and then went to Hope Station across the river from Hope in 1902 and 1903. She said there were five houses there with 15 children. She wrote home, mother, the place is called hope, but it should be called despair. Um, after that, she went to trail and then came to Revelstoke to teach at uh, Central School and taught there for six and a half years until she married uh, Philip Parker, who was a railway engineer. Um, the principal of um, Central School was A.E. Miller, and he was a mountaineer and he took his teachers on, on long hikes into the mountains, um, including Mount Revelstoke before there was a trail there. Um, he, Miller Lake it is named after Miller. Um, he, was a, he was also a member of the, uh, or, and Eva was a member of the Alpine Club of Canada in 1906 when the club formed. And as I mentioned, participated in the camp at Yoho. Um, and uh, a Revelstoke Mountaineering Club was formed in 1909, and she was the vice president of the club at that time. Um, so Eva Lake on Mount Revelstoke is named after her. Um, the, she said, we have an interview with her. And she said, in 1909, I undertook to camp up there with my sisters and two friends. And we had a packer take our equipment up on the horse and put up our tent. And we were up there for three weeks. Well, we were up there just hiking around and enjoying ourselves. Five men from the Mountaineering Club, that was the club I belonged to, came up. They were going to put up a little log hut, the first, uh, the first chalet. We agreed we five would work with their five one day if they'd go hiking with us the next day. Well, I worked with a man on a cross-cut saw cutting down trees. My sister worked with a man with a team of horses. And we did their cooking and their dishwashing 
and they supplied us with wood. Well, one day we were going out hiking and one of the men had heard that there was a lake somewhere up there. So we decided to hunt and we scouted around the valley, no trails, you know. Finally, we found a very nice lake. And from photographs that this man had seen, he said, well, this is Miller Lake. Then we decided to go farther on and we went around the valley. We were going up some cliffs. Well, I'm a mountaineer, climbing is nothing to me. I mean, when I was young, but the other gir girls were, well, you know what girls are, have to be helped. Mm -hmm. And besides, we all wore skirts right down to our ankles. That's not much good. And the men stayed behind and helped the girls and I went ahead. Um, I went over a hill and I came back. I said, there's another lake up here. Um, well, nobody believed me. When we got up, it's a bigger lake than Miller Lake. Mr. Blackmore said, well, he never heard of this one. We'll call it your lake. We'll call it Eva Lake. It's Eva Lake yet. And what's more, he wrote to Ottawa and had the permission to have the lake named in my name. I'd rather have that than a tombstone in the cemetery. <laughs> On another trip, she said, about 16 of us were going to Eva Lake, uh, including Bob Blackmore and a young lad, 16, called Mike Marcus Hyatt. Um, we uh, 12 uh, uh, stayed at Eva Lake, but Bob, Marcus, Eva, and her sister decided to go over the glacier that was there. They said they would be back by 4 o'clock. But she said, at 4 o'clock, we weren't even to the glacier. You know, distances are deceptive, and there was an awful lot of climbing to do. We crossed the glacier and thought if we crossed to the other side, came down the lip, we could get back to Eva Lake easier. Slide, Alder, Devil's Club, nine o'clock, it was dark and we didn't know where we were. We weren't anywhere near the lake. So Mr. Blackmore made a fire, he had an ax. And the two kids, my sister and Marcus, laid down one each side of the fire and slept. While we two, two older people, we figured we were responsible. We kept turning them over. Because, you know, you get burned on one side and frozen on the other. And then when the light came up, we were at the foot of another glacier. No wonder it was cold. The new moon came up just after two o'clock. And at four o'clock, we were back where we, were where we had cached our lunch. And at seven o'clock, we were back at the camp. So I just wanted to quickly mention uh, Mrs. H.N. Corsier. She was also a member of the, the Mountaineering Club. And uh, she was with the group of people who were up on Mount Revelstoke in uh, 1909, working on the, the, the chalet. And um, that was the year that the first trail was built to Mount Revelstoke, up Mount Revelstoke as well. It was called the Lindmark Trail, but uh, it's now what's known as the Mount Revelstoke Trail. And the Lindmark Trail at some point was the, the, the secondary trail around the back was renamed Lindmark Trail. Uh, but in any case, um, Mrs. Corsier was up on the mountain in 1909, and while she was up there, uh, their uh, young son, uh, Lancelot, who was nicknamed Dooley, who was about six years old, and he and another boy were playing in the uh, Columbia River just below near Front Street, because the family lived at the end of Front Street, where the River's Edge apartment building is now. And... Um, Dooley fell into the water and drowned. And Mr. Corsier had to climb up the mountain to find his wife and tell her that their son had died. So um, it's a very tragic circumstance. Of course, their um, youngest daughter, Isabel, was um, known you know, as the Women's World Ski Jumping Champion of Canada. And there's that lovely statue now in front of uh, City Hall. Uh, in her honor of uh, last year was the 100th anniversary of her, her jump. I uh, also want to mention Sophie Atkinson, who was a um, uh, well-known painter from England. Um, she had a, a published book, uh, an artist in Cor Corfu, which she'd published in 1911. She was a trained artist and um, had come to Canada and had, had actually um, done some work with the group of seven at the time and did uh, did some exhibitions in Canada. And then in the late 40s, she was uh, came back to Canada and spent some time on, here in Revelstoke and on Mount Revelstoke and decided that she loved it here. So she lived here for quite a few years after that. And she was the one that started the Revelstoke Art Club. 
and uh, trained a lot of, of uh, painters here. There's a, still a few people in town that have taken less, that took lessons from her. And uh, she spent a lot of time on Mount Revelstoke um, painting. So I wanted to mention her as well. Uh, there, the uh, Kelowna Art Gallery this year is doing an exhibition on the paintings of Sophie Atkinson and Nellie Duke, who was an Okanagan painter who uh, spent uh, one summer up at Heather Lodge and did uh, uh, some paintings up there. We've got one painting in her collection. But the um, Kelowna Museum is going to be borrowing 13 uh, Sophie Atkinson paintings from our collection for the exhibit. So I think it's opening in... Uh, in May of this year. So if you're in Kelowna and get a chance to, to go in, it should be a, a great, a lovely exhibition to see. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Emma Roberts. And uh, Emma was, um, let's see what time it is. Um, Emma was um, born in uh, Cornwall, England in 1883 and um, I came to Canada in probably about 19, mid 1910s, about 1915 or so. And uh, her husband worked on the bridge and building gangs with the CPR. Um, she took uh, tons of photographs of this area. Um, we've got uh, an album that uh, she donated to the museum um, back in the, probably in the 1970s. And it's uh, in our archives, there's a few hundred photographs in there, and a lot of them are of her trips into the mountains. So there's about 1919 when they'd gone up to the, that was the original chalet at uh, Balsam Lake, which he also is also referred to as Prospect Lake in uh, some of uh, her photographs as well. <clears throat> she also renamed some of the lakes after her daughters, Cherry and Eileen too. Uh, but they, those were never the official names. But uh, they spent a lot of time um, hiking. They did a, some trips by on horse, uh, take uh, pack horses up, but most of the time they were just climbing up on their own. They did one trip in 1919 when they spent a couple of weeks up at, at Miller Lake in that area. So several women in the, the, of course, you're not supposed to do that now, <laughs> go off trail, but. And uh, this is uh, on their Miller Lake trip in 1919. This is uh, climbing one of the old cliffs above uh, above Miller Lake. This is one of my favorite photographs. And they all had their little dog. I think it was like a little Boston Terrier with them on a lot of their trips. And there's at the second Green Lake, which is the Jade Lake. It'd be, uh, it's, uh, she, they called it the uh, Upper and Lower Jade Lakes. They called First and Second Green Lake. There's a nice picture of them at Miller Lake. So it's a great album. There's just some really amazing photographs in that. There's, uh, I think it's this one or a similar one is of uh, the lake is on one of the, the pictures that we've got on the wall there. And there's a picture of Emma Roberts standing on the ice on Belsom Lake at 5.30 a.m. on July 14th, 1920. So it's still pretty thick ice in the middle of July. And this is a lovely photograph um, that uh, she took at Hart Lake, which is Heather Lake, in uh, August of 1920. So just a month after. So when the snow goes, it goes quickly. And uh, there's another sort of iconic photograph from her collection of she and her daughters just on the rise above Revelstoke in 1919. That one we've reproduced quite a bit as well. We've got that one available as a poster. Um, so I also wanted to talk about this uh, group there. There was a little film company that came here in February of 1914 and they were looking for some local skiers to go up with them to participate in a film shoot. So there was several local men and women who stayed up there for a week. Um, Edith Johnson, Mary Burridge, who became Mary McRae, 
uh, Stuart McKinley, Jim McDonald, Marge English, Ken Zant, who became uh, Marge Meyer, uh, Gerald Dickey, John Lightbound, Byron Morrison, Lloyd Benison, and Jim Byrne. Um, so while well, they were up there, um, this was um, this is the photograph that we used on the cover of our first tracks book because it's such an iconic photo. Uh, I think this woman right here is Auntie Marge. So um, they, um, I've been, I've tried to tra track the film, but I haven't been able to to find out whether it was ever actually produced or not. But we haven't been able to find out whether it still exists anywhere. It'd be great to see that. Um, but um, Auntie Marge said that um, they were given these sweaters for the photo shoot. And after the end of the shoot, they gave the sweaters back. Oh, so. <laughs> and um, the, this was also a photograph from Auntie Marge's collection of uh, the people used to go up, they'd have groups go up by train to a glacier and they'd go skiing. Um, so backcountry skiing from Rogers and Rogers Pass um, from uh, from Glacier. There was no Glacier House there at the time, but they'd, they'd go up to the station and then get up into the mountains from there. And I uh, wanted to include this really cute picture of uh, Mary Burridge and Alex McRae on their honeymoon at Heather Lodge in 1941. So, was Heather Lodge was built at the summit in 1939, and it was just a really favorite place for skiers to, to go up in the winter. Um, people would, would ski up and then ski at the summit and then ski back down again because there was no road access in the winter, of course. But I absolutely love their matching sweaters. <laughs> and then um, at uh, a few weeks ago at my talk on mining in the Lardo, I mentioned Alice Jowett, but when you talk about women in the mountains, you know, she was really quite an amazing mountain woman. Um, she uh, was multifaceted. She was a hotel owner. So she ran the hotel at Trout Lake, the Windsor um, Hotel, which is still there, and uh, was uh, mining. And she mined, uh, was still operating her mines well into her 80s. And um, apparently her son-in-law took her horse away from her when she was in her late 80s. And she got quite annoyed about that. Uh, but this is her in the, um, just in the doorway with the, the, the black hat and black sweater in the, the mine of her, uh, claim, of her claim cabin, Foggy Day. Uh, she was actually one of the more successful miners in the Lardo. Uh, she had some quite... Uh, rich strikes there and did did very well. So spent a lot of her time up in the in the mountains in the claims. And then I also showed this photograph recently, but it's just such a stunning photo. It's a Brown Creek Basin and the ba Brown Creek flows northeast into Lardo Creek on the east side of Trout Lake. And uh, to see this woman here is aiming a rifle. I can't quite tell what this woman is doing, what she's holding. But there's a little girl on the other end of a, a cross-cut saw with a with a man. So pretty amazing photograph of women in the mountains right there. Um, as I said, the stories are endless and I've just kind of touched the surface here. I did want to talk about a couple of groups that are operating now. Uh, there's a group called Ascent Mentorships and they actually uh, mentor uh, women um, they, they do sort of season long mentorships uh, for uh, women for backcountry skiing and snowboarding. And um, Robin Goldsmith is one on the board of directors of this organization. And she said that they usually have uh, four times the number of applicants than they have mentors available to work with women. So it's a very popular uh, program. And uh, just making sure that, as they said, that there's um, you know, space in the backcountry touring uh, lifestyle for women, and then they're encouraged to uh, to you know, get encouraged and empowered uh, for uh, backcountry uh, touring and skiing. And um, another group called Girls Do Ski, which is based out of Revelstoke, and uh, they're here to to support other women who are in the backcountry as well. Also, want to mention. Um, Zoya Lynch and Nat Siegel, they produced this film last year called Beyond Begbie. I had a chance to see it at the Performing Arts Center. And um, 
it's more than just about women in the back country, but it's really about our relationship with Mount Begbie. And that the, the evening that it was a part of was, was about um, other you know, women and indigenous people and people of color uh, participating in, uh, in extreme sports. Uh, both, uh, there was even a surfing film there as well. Um, but uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, there's still women in the mountains and there always will be. So there's lots of inspiration to be taken from the women of the past and inspiration from women now who are out there doing great things. So uh, that's the end of the talk. So this is the uh, the commercial portion of the evening or the of the talk. Um, so just a reminder that we're doing our snapshot of history farewell party tomorrow at seven o'clock here. And uh, we'll be doing live auction of the framed photos in this room, the five framed ones, and the silent auction of the rest. And uh, there, as you can see, there are 11 by 14 uh, photos mounted on foam core, and they'll all be available uh, tomorrow um, for, for auction. And then of course, we'll be having some fun too. We probably will make up a little bit of a quiz based on the photos and uh, encourage people to join us for that. Um, the BC's Marvelous Mushrooms exhibit uh, will open on Saturday, April 29th and run until August 17th. That will be here in this room. Um, so um, I, their next brown bag history is on April 5th. So there's three weeks in between instead of two. And it'll be on newspapers in Revelstoke. And uh, so we'll be having that one. And then two weeks after that, um, we'll be having our um, final formal brown bag history of the season. And that's going to be a 20th anniversary uh, brown bag lunch. So you'll actually get a brown bag lunch. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, I'll be having a sign up sheet for that uh, before too long uh, so that we'll, we'll need to know how many sandwiches to make for that one. Um, but yeah, it's, um, we've been doing brown bag history for 20 years. I've done over 350 talks. Um, so uh, we thought it, it's time to celebrate that. And then I won't be doing programs here while the mushroom exhibit is up, but might find some other places in the community where we can do some talks, maybe find a um, restaurant or something that would, would host us for a brown bag, bag talk or an outdoor location. So we'll, uh, I haven't quite figured that out yet, but we'll, we'll probably be finding some way to continue some talks while uh, this room is occupied. Uh, so thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you in three weeks.